Stanky Frams here with lesson number three in a wacky sound education. Today we're going to be talking about setup and teardown and how to make connections. First, I'm going to have my buddy Jethro tell you how to set up a room for live sound. At the risk of stating the obvious, if you are starting with an empty room, the first thing you have to determine is where the band will be located or speaker and where the audience will sit. Once this is established, the house speakers typically go at the front of the room so that the sound coming from the speakers blends naturally with the performers themselves instead of the sound coming from behind you or from the side. And once you've located the speakers, that determines where the power amp will be located. The power amp has to be located close enough to the speakers in order for the wires to reach. The next decision to be made is where to place the mixer. This is probably one of the most important decisions in setting up the room. It's important for the mixer to be out in the audience if possible so that you can hear what the audience is hearing as you're adjusting the sound. It's also important for it to be out of view if possible or, is, or behind the audience because no one wants to see you twisting the dials and knobs and doing your magic. It's very distracting. So it's best if it's behind the audience. There are times when you don't have cords long enough to put the mixer behind the audience. Sometimes the mixer ends up on stage and this can be very distracting to the audience but sometimes it's necessary. The placement of your four major components, the inputs or where the band or speaker is located, the mixer, power amp, and house speakers are not done in a vacuum. When you're placing these components you have to keep in mind what kind of wires you have and the length of those wires. If you're putting the mixer in the back of the room and you have a band, you probably have to have a snake in order to get all of those components connected into the mixing board. Sometimes if all you're doing is just a single individual speaker with a microphone, you can gang mic wires together in order to get the length of wiring you need to run to the back of the room. So the snake will connect the inputs to the mixing board and then the next step is to get the output over to the power amp which is typically a separate wire that runs from the output of the snake over to the power amp and then you connect up your speakers to your power amp as we described in a previous lesson. There's three things we want to avoid when setting up sound. The big pop, the big squeal, and the big fire. We want to avoid all three of those things. How do you avoid those? Well, the big pop you avoid by making all your connections, everything from beginning to end, before you turn on the power amp. The power amp is the last thing that you should turn on when you, after you've made all your connections. If your mixing board is separate from your power amp, you turn on your mixing board first, and then your power amp is the very last thing. The pop is caused because if the power amp is on and the volume is up, and it's connected to the speakers, and you're about to make a connection, there's a small electrical arc that will happen and that gets amplified through the system and pops and can blow your speakers. Very bad. Avoid the big pop. There's one exception to this and that is if you got your room completely set up. It's very common for musicians to show up with guitars and things they want to plug in. You don't have to power down the amp in order to do that. You just have to mute the individual channel they're about to plug into so that whatever pop there is as they make the connection doesn't get past the mixing board and get into the amp. Next is the big squeal. We don't want any squeals. No feedback please. How do you avoid that? Well, let me just talk about the fundamentals of feedback. It primarily and almost always happens through microphones. The most common microphones you'll deal with are, are unidirectional. That is, they only take sound inputs directly down their throat. You can see I'm speaking right down the throat of the microphone. As I continue to rotate the microphone and get over to the side, the volume goes way down. It's not picking up my voice, even though my lips are almost right on the microphone. That's because you've got to speak right down the throat of the microphone. They're made that way to try to prevent feedback. You can see I'm standing really close to this speaker, but the cone of collection is in this direction. All that it takes for feedback is for me to point that cone of collection toward the speaker. Doesn't take very much and I end up with feedback. 
But look, I'm standing right here close to the speaker. It's just that the cone of collection is up here, not toward the, not toward the speaker. So just make sure in your arrangement of speakers and microphones that no microphones, the throat or the boresight of the microphones are not pointed toward those speakers or you start getting feedback like what you just hear or you get really shrill feedback like that. It's your job as the sound person to make sure that that orientation avoids any feedback. And if you do get feedback, the immediate thing you have to do is turn the volume down on that mic to make sure it doesn't blow the speakers. But the bigger picture is that you've got to make sure that the arrangement of where the microphones are relative to the speakers is in the correct location. It's that simple. And the third thing we want to avoid is the big fire. What do I mean by that? This equipment can overheat and it can destroy the amplifiers. The way you avoid that is by using the correct wires for the correct plugs. You don't add more speakers than the power amp is capable of handling. So that means don't gang speakers together, one after the other, after the other, after the other. This Fender system is meant to run four speakers and really four speakers only. And we in our community have it on occasion try to use our amplifiers to drive more than that many speakers and we have damaged Fender and other sound systems that we've had to then either repair or throw away. One other tiny little aspect is to make sure you're using speaker wires to run between the power amp and to the speaker. How about connectors? What kind of connectors do we have? There's basically three different kinds. So the first most common one that you'll see used is called XLR. It has three pins in the middle, has these kind of very sturdy connectors. Sometimes they have clips or buttons. So if I try to pull this out, it will not pull out. I've got to press the button before I pull it out. Always pull by the connector, not by the wire. These are used for many different things, but they're often called mic cables. A second type of connection is a quarter inch jack. Quarter inch means how the diameter of the, of the pin itself. And it plugs, it just plugs or slides into one of those holes. And finally, a third type of connector are called RCA jacks because the company RCA invented them. They're typically used to make stereo connections. Usually there's a right and a left, right being the red. One last common connector thing is this is called a direct box or a hot box. And what it has on one side is it takes inputs from a quarter inch jack and converts it to an XLR. Coming directly from my guitar, I plug into the hot box and I plug my XLR into the other side and then that way I can connect a guitar into the XLR input. And that has to do with, a little bit with sound quality as well as the distance you're going to run the wires. Coming out are the speaker wires and on the Fender system it lives again at kind of a quarter inch jack. It goes into these outputs, speaker outputs. This is the back of our gig rack. So we have two options for how to go to speakers. We can use the quarter inch jack that we used before. Or there is another type of fitting that goes into this circular round hole. Unfortunately, I don't have the cabling with me. But it basically is a round barrel that slides in and twists and that locks it in place. Finally, I do not have a snake here with me, so I can't show you what a snake looks like, but it's basically a box about this big, and it's got a bunch of XLR connections. Let me put these XLR connections or mic cords into the box, and typically there's anywhere from 12 to 16 channels. And one last thing on disassembling these systems, you want to turn off the power amp first so that as you unplug things and turn other systems off, those pops don't get to the speakers. So on powering up, the power amp is the last thing to be turned on. When coming down, it's, it's the first thing to be turned off. As you disassemble things, the only advice I have is be gentle with the wires. Hold them, hold the connectors. Don't pull on the wires themselves. These input wires, mic cords as well as guitar cords and other cords, they have RF shielding around them. It's very easy for them to get broken and start shorting out and not working. And they're very expensive. So the preferred method for coiling these is to coil them in nice circles with no sharp ends and use these Velcro straps to finally wrap around them 
to contain them and to hold them in place. That's the preferred method. Uh, there are people who have a different philosophy. They believe you bundle them like this, wrap it like that. I, I believe those are too, too sharp a turns and that kind of stretching and bending will cause the life of these uh, expensive wires to be shortened. Speaker wires, on the other hand, are a little bit more sturdy and they can handle a little bit more abuse. So that's all there is to connections and set up and tear down. Oh, come back and see us for lesson number four with another wacky sound education. Stanky signing off.